In the early morning hours of August 8, 2014, a trail of blood marked a path down the quiet street of Pueblo Way in Las Vegas, Nevada. It would veer off into the National Holy Golf Course and then make an in-curve back toward each residence along the way, leaving bloody footprints in the backyard deckings and bloody palm prints on the windows, eventually culminating at the kitchen door of the very last house at the end of the street. The occupant of that household would awaken to a bang on the window, accompanied by a blood-curdling scream. The distressing noise would prompt them to immediately call 911, yet the frightening sight of what they saw when they looked outside would prevent them from opening the door. Curled up on the floor would be the horrific consequence of so-called toxic love and the conclusion of a tragic tale rampant with abuse of power and control. To fully acquire an understanding of this moment, we must take into account each of the bizarre circumstances that occurred beforehand, and that takes us back to the very beginning of this story. I don't know, man. If anybody gets in my face, obviously you can't hit them, right? Or you're off the show? You'll use your best judgment. Oh, okay. There are consequences for everything. Okay. And you'll use your best judgment. All right, what if it's self-defense? Use your best judgment. Knock them out, yeah. You Third did. round, yeah. Knee. Where You're insane. It? See, he's insane. This one is... Uh, good. Knock, insane. knock, you know. Where was yeah. it? Who, where was it? San play? Manuel, Mike Robles. Mexican guy, he thinks he's all the shit, but, you know, I put him in his place. This morning, I already went to the gym at 5.45. I was hoping I could get a second trip today, you know, so. But I've been shadow boxing in the, in the bathroom, so. Are you a good fighter? Of course, that's why I fight. If I wasn't good, I would have really? fucking quit. You gotta muscle up a little bit, though. Yeah? You seem a little bit soft. All these guys are coming in all... Yeah, I've, uh, you know, I got six inches of reach on them. All right, you'll be able to use it. Probably not. Yeah. I mean, we'll see. We'll, we'll, I mean, what are they going? Are they going to take me down? Yeah. I mean, that's okay. That's what they're going to do. That's okay. They're going to take you down and beat your face in. What's all over your tent? What are all those tents mean? Like? Anarchy. Game bred. That means I was born. I'm bred to fight. Never quit. That's a long story. That's a long story. <laughs> yeah. You're peeking through keyholes at naked women? What is that? No, nah, she's little. She's only like eight, probably 12 or something. She's praying. Got me some impaled people. So I like them. I was a little kid. Bro, these are the worst tattoos I've ever seen. Thank you, Daniel, man. Like, straight up, I have never seen tattoos this bad before. Why is this so bad? I saw that movie, uh, Dracula. Yeah. And the impaled bodies in it. Got me excited, so I decided to get that tattoo. Yeah. It says War Machine. It's my fight name. War Machine? Oh. Yeah. John War Machine Copenhaver? Yeah. These were the audition tapes for season six of The Ultimate Fighter. For those of you unfamiliar with the program, the basic premise is similar to the genre of reality TV. You have a group of total strangers confined to a relatively small living space, multiple cameras to film each and every development that might occur, and all external sources of stimulation are taken away without exception. This means no phone, no TV, and absolutely no communication with the outside world. The simple reasoning behind this is to create tension, as tension can lead to hostility, and hostility can make for great television. I want to go, what if you I want Friday. to go on Friday now. That is it. I don't want to be here anymore. I do not want to be amongst Jula. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Sorry. Bro, that is the most British hat I've ever seen, dude. Oh. I don't want to be dude, around dude, people. I give it to my fucking shit about how I'm feeling. Oh, you look. The public wrote me out because I don't want to be here. I fucking hate it. I fucking hate living with these two faces. And because I don't suck people's fucking assholes, I'm up for eviction every week. But I ain't sucking asshole. I'm not gonna suck fucking assholes. The only real difference between the more mainstream reality shows such as Big Brother compared to the considerably more target-marketed Ultimate Fighter is that the participants are solely made up of professional MMA fighters. Not only that, but they are each put into a single elimination tournament in which they must compete against each other, with the winning prize being a six-figure contract with the UFC, the world's leading MMA promotion. 
To put in simpler terms, 16 guys live in a house together for six weeks, and they all fight in a cage every few days until just one victor remains. That's the entire show in a nutshell. So it would come as no surprise that some of the characters that voluntarily put themselves in this situation- Bro, this TV show probably was sick. I kind of want to watch this shit instead. I mean, this is like actually good television, man. Back in the day, back in the day, TV producers were buck wild. Like, I would love to watch this shit. It's, it's still going? Wait, really? Situation aren't exactly the most mentally stable of individuals. What the fuck, dude? This is so good. That dude's eyes are fucked up. They let him bang, and that's what happened, dude. Bro, let me fucking bang, bro. Let me bang again, man. I'll let you bang. I'll let you bang. Let me bang again. Let me bang. Yo, this is so gay. Let me bang. Just on a quick side note, it really is a shame the producers decided to put pretentious and dramatic music over this segment, as it somewhat takes away from the unintentional comedic brilliance of the moment. That's too soft. No, 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 no. It's characters like this, of which there have been many, that have made the show one of the most popular in the world among the 18 to 25 male demographic. The program can make anyone a viral sensation for both the right and wrong reasons. Heroes and villains alike have become Happy Pride like Month, boys. superstars of the UFC via this route of indoctrination. One of whom was 26-year-old John Copenhaver, aka War Machine, who started off the show as one of the least popular contestants. His first few segments of airtime consisted of him either getting drunk, destroying property, fighting with other contestants, or making crude and indelicate remarks over a multitude of sensitive topics. He acted in a brash and somewhat primitive manner throughout the first half of the series, yet he managed to turn things around in episode 8, as he finally opened up and bared his soul in the lead-up segment to his fight. Before being here, you know, people would always say stupid shit like, your past, your childhood, this and that. You know, it could affect the way you turn out, you know? <clears throat> it could affect dumb things, even like, like fighting or whatever, anything. Bro, this is the first time this dude has ever written, okay? This dude has never written before. I'm still not convinced he knows how to write. But I am convinced that it's top of the hour, which is time for a six second hour break. Fuck, I got you. Not a single one of you motherfuckers. Oh, oh, it's so good. He's probably writing top of the hour every hour. It's time for a 60-second ad break. But he's also writing down there. If you'd like to no longer see the ads, all you need to do is subscribe, you know? You subscribe for $5 or for free. With a fucking, with a motherfucking Twitch Prime, baby. Know what I'm saying? Uh. Here's the one minute break now. I'm like, yeah, right, dude. But it doesn't matter, man. My dad died. I gave him CPR. Big deal. Big fucking deal. No, I, I, I thought, hey, I'm strong. I, I got past all of that. I don't ever think about it, ever. But I'm just here now, nothing to do. And, you know, I think about everything. Could you speak a bit about how social media is or isn't beneficial to democratic values in the U.S.? You got it, man. Time. Hey, yo, guys, fuck this video. And fuck all 38,000 of you. We're going to talk about how social media may or may not be beneficial to the democratic values of the U.S. <laughs> 
He went from the least to the most popular fighter over the course of a single episode, and although he lost his fight via close decision and was eliminated in the first round, he remained a favorite from that moment on, and was even given a second chance at the show's pay-per-view final where he faced off against another popular contestant. The fight essentially guaranteed the winner a place in the UFC, and losing in the show could now be redeemed for one of them, but they needed to win, and win in spectacular fashion. This is the DM cable as well, but uh, yeah, Chatter, Chatter literally just wants me to do his homework for him. Okay, he thinks he's slick. They should do this but with Twitch streamers. Damn, he's getting his ass cheeks clapped, dude. No, this is like literally a fucking. This is like a, a sanctioned UFC fight. A little bit of gore from this is not like it's not gore. A little bit of blood splatter from this is not. What is it called? Like unrestricted gore or something is what they call it. Oh god damn, he's clapping him. The fight game is closely associated with the notion of mountaintops and valleys. Okay, the highs are so incredibly stuff, high, okay. yet the lows are e Chat, there's literally a UFC Twitch channel. Please stop. Like, they show fights and shit on this platform. Please stop, okay? <laughs> like, that it's a sport. That's not going to... That's not what they mean when they say, like, crazy gore. Equally as low. And this requires an all-or-nothing approach to life. To win it all, you have to risk it all. Imagine training for months on end for an occasion that lasts 15 minutes at the most, and the outcome of that occasion means everything. If you win, there won't be many things that compare to the elation of that moment. But if you lose, the emotional pain can be devastating, and many have correlated the feelings with total despair and hopelessness. The fight game is essentially a complete gamble, oh! not just from a physical and financial standpoint, but from a psychological and what some would consider a spiritual one too. To be great, you must take great risk, and the long-term odds will be heavily stacked against you. John Copenhaver had reached the mountaintop on this occasion, Yet his descent into the That's valley the would soon follow. His next Biden fight took place on May 24th of 2008, and he was submitted just 56 seconds into the first round. He was released from the UFC and had multiple run-ins with the law soon after. He was eventually charged with two counts of assault, the first of which was for choking a man unconscious in a parking lot. To have that image out there that a fighter is choking people out is scary. Well, but that's nice to choke him out, because if we wanted to, we could smash their whole body apart. So a choke is nice and quiet, nice and peaceful. You take a little nap and you wake up. You know how I'm done. Okay, this dude literally should... I mean, he's already in jail, but... Like, he should have been in jail at that point. You know what I mean? Like... Dude, hey, Detective detective Haas on the case. Uh, You, my friend, failed the vibe check. Okay? Fucked vibes is what I'm getting. You are sentenced to jail. You are a menace to society. And you will now be going to jail... Yeah, big, big vibe, ch uh, vibe check failure right there. You know, on the, on the other hand, you smash from the pieces and they, you know, they really hurt. So that's a nice way out. The second assault charge was for rendering a bouncer unconscious at a nightclub. There's always a little bit of tension between us. He's a big dude, about like 6'4", 320 pounds, big giant dude. And that night in particular, uh, we had words that kept escalating. You know, he was going to beat me up, I was going to beat him up, we're talking shit, talking shit, talking shit. And eventually it got to the point where it's like, oh, what's up? And he's like, what's up? You know, do something. He's telling me to do something, do something, egging me on, egging me on, egging me on. Kind of challenging me, you want to fight? I'm like, dude, you don't want to fight me. So yeah, come on, let's do it, come on, let's do it. We did it. He lost. It was only one punch, I didn't, you know, I didn't terrorize him. One punch. He lost, I won, I got in trouble. Had I lost, I would have went home, went to sleep. Woke up and said, I'm not going to do that again. Some people are a little bit different. They like to pick fights and they like to, you know, call the cops. So, you know, that, that's his problem. In a surprising display of leniency from the court, he was only sentenced to three years. So one of the chatter also pointed this out. I was about to say, do not fuck with motherfuckers with cauliflower ear, okay? I learned that in college the hard way. Somebody's got cauliflower ears, dude. Do not fucking touch them. They... They will try to fight you, don't fight them, okay? 
Just don't do it. What did you do? I mean, the Rutgers wrestling team are, are a bunch of fucking freaks, okay? They were a bunch of fucking absolute freaks. And, uh, like, I saw the team captain literally go horizontal and, like, fucking double Superman punch uh, one of the brothers in the fraternity one time. Ever since then, I don't fuck with dudes with cauliflower ears. Imagine ear. subscribing eight months to a champagne socialist how embarrassing brother. I've just never seen some shit like that. Just fully horizontal. Noel Miller, if he had a growth spurt kick. Like he was in an anime or something. It was Will, wasn't it? No. Years probation with 30 days of community service. He knew he was extremely lucky not to get jail time, and this allowed him to resume his career in MMA and attempt to rise once more. He openly stated that his plan was to fight in small town shows against low level opponents in the hope that a long winning streak and improved record would allow him to return to the UFC. He had a clear cut goal, along with the blueprints on how to get there, and everything started going according to plan. Ariel Hawani for fanhouse.com being joined by MMA fighter War Machine and oh, War Machine shit. you are on an impressive three This dude is uh even I know this guy my my friend works with him or worked with him I think he just recently left uh Did he just recently leave like ESPN or something I saw my friend post about him He leaves the ESPN on the 15th. Ariel's the goat of MMA Guys, reporting. I just got microchipped. Can I get a W? Three fight winning streak as of late. You feeling uh, a little more comfortable in your MMA career now? Uh, you know what, dude? It's uh, you know, I belong in the big shows. You know what I mean? So I've been going around and you know, uh, beating up these. You know, undefeated hometown heroes like uh, De Lorenzi up in Canada and uh, Rashad Woods on D in D.C. And uh, I mean, uh, these are just guys that uh, that uh, I sh I'm supposed to be. You know what I mean? I mean, I'm the real deal, dude. You know, uh, I'm not a I'm not a scrub. So I'm just uh, you know, I'm just gonna keep keep on kicking ass until I uh, get back into the UFC or back into a big show. At this moment in time, the UFC required a six to one win to loss ratio to even yeah. be considered for a contract. This meant John had to win three more fights to get another shot. He would win the next two, one by submission and the other by technical knockout, but then lose the third via a close fought split decision. This loss would have been a very hard pill to swallow as it essentially meant he would have to start from scratch. Not quite at the bottom, but not far from it. The momentum he had built was now gone despite all the work it took to get there. It would have been a remarkably harsh dose of reality when he woke up the next morning and he appeared to go off the rails soon after. Prosecutors played surveillance video from in and outside Thrusters Lounge in Pacific Beach. It immediately knocked me back. I, I grabbed from my mouth and kind of fell backwards on, onto my, my butt. And it took me a few seconds to, to kind of come out of my days. Bouncer Matthew Compton said the UFC fighter War Machine, who had his name legally changed from John Copenhaver, punched him several times in the mouth. Compton said he was dazed, his lip was split, and two of his teeth loosened. Seconds later, he said the brawl moved outside where another security camera captured the action. Beyond aggressive. Uh, uh, That's the second vibe check failure. I see somebody legally change their name to War Machine. Sorry, sir, you gotta go. You have now failed the subsequent vibe check, the second vibe check of the day.
you're definitely doubly going to jail. It's jail time times two for you. Okay. Crazy almost. That's the best way I can describe it. Just he was seeing nothing else. He was rendered a term of one year to be served at the San Diego County Jail, but was granted a two-month delay before starting his sentence. He reportedly used this time to mainly go out and party, but also managed to cram in one final fight just days before his surrender date. Had a tough battle with John Alessio. Match didn't go your way. Care to reflect on it? Trans people have to do so much shit to get their name changed. This motherfucker just changed his legal name to War Machine? Yeah, of course. Uh, you know, uh, I actually did a lot better than I thought I was going to do. I, uh, I pretty much knew I would lose it, unless I got a lucky knockout. I uh, trained for five days for the fight. I'm in the worst shape I've ever been in my whole life. <laughs> so I was like, oh man, it was a weird uh, mental game to go into this fight. Usually I'm confident I think I'm going to win. This time I really knew I would lose, but I was hoping for a lucky something. So uh, I did better than I thought I was going to do, so I'm happy for that. But I still would have you know, rather won, of course. But Now I know you've had a lot of drama uh, coming up and stuff like that. Did that at all get in your head for this fight? Yeah, I mean, sure. You know, uh, you know fighting is a, a mental game, so... You want to always have everything going as smooth as possible before a fight. So I have a lot of stress, you know. I'm going to go to jail and, uh, for a year next week. And, uh, you know, I, I just don't want to go to jail because <laughs> it's going to be boring, you know. I can't train. I can't fight. I can't, I can't get laid, you know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, nothing's. I can't even have delicious snacks, no pizza, nothing, you know what I mean? So it's going to suck. But, I mean, I'm not worried nothing else. I don't think anyone's going to try and mess with me. I mean, it's county jail. It's not prison. So everyone there is a year or less. So they all want to go home, too. So I don't expect, and I'm not in a gang, so there's no reason for people to mess with me. I'm just going to mind my own business read some books uh i'm gonna just do push-ups and sit-ups and all that kind of stuff um any last thing you want to say to the fans out there uh thanks thanks for uh, sticking by me and uh you know i'll be back in a year and uh I'll be in shape and I'll, have, I'll do good fights. So <laughs> He was initially meant to serve exactly one year in jail, yet would go on to serve over two, as the judge extended his sentence due to preceding street fights that came to light. He was made to serve a large majority of his time in- Oh my god, they added to his sentence because- Bro. Bro, what the fuck? They were like, oh fuck, you're actually, you, you are literally a menace. Like, they were like, shit, we thought you just did one street fight, Mr. War Machine. Turns out you can't stop yourself. They checked his logs. In solitary confinement for undisclosed reasons, and he was released directly from solitary onto the streets on October 29th, 2012. He conceptualized a clothing brand during his incarceration and would launch it with a friend just days after his release. He also started a video diary on social media where he virtually admitted to taking steroids and at times came across as completely unhinged and maniacal. Oh my f yeah, no shit, dude. Look at his fucking face. Like, how do you think that happened, dude? Look at his face here. Before jail. Look at his face after jail, bro. His release. He also started a video diary on social media where he virtually admitted to taking steroids and at times came across as completely unhinged and maniacal. Oh my fucking God, I'm so fucking pissed off right now. <laughs> dude, I've been craving a fucking Slurpee. Slurpee. Bro, what is the mouth, dude? What that mouth do, bro? I mean, he's got like one of those like I don't know how to describe it. He's he just has like he looks like a demon, dude. Since last night, I want a Slurpee. I want a fucking Slurpee. And I and, and I see 7-Eleven. So I Bro, he's he's Fucking cheeks got muscles on them, dude. Look at that. Go, and I want to get a Slurpee. And I fill out my fucking cup. And the fucking bitch who fucking works there fucking tells me that I need to take off my fucking hoodie on my head. I was like, what? Huh? And the fucking bitch tells me that I have to fucking take off my hoodie or she's not going to fucking serve me a fucking Slurpee. Are you fucking serious? Oh my god, I'm so I'm fucking freaked the fuck out. And then the fucking other asshole that works there says he's gonna call the cops. I wanna, I'm so I wanna, oh, I wanna smash the fucking motherfucker. So I went, so I fucking, I dumped my fucking Slurpee on the floor. 
Just uh. those fucking dumb motherfuckers c- clean it up. Why? Oh my god, I'm so fucking mad. <laughs> why can't I just get a fucking Slurpee? Why, why the mother- <laughs> Dude, dude, he's literally an ape, dude. Dude. I mean, that, like, this dude, this dude literally, I mean, he, he got so much worse after prison. <laughs> this motherfucker is the reason why, I mean, this is another glaring example of our, of our recidivism rate. Okay. This passes the uh, vibe check? No, definitely not. Definitely not. Fuck is gonna harass me and tell me to take out my fucking hoodie. I'm gonna go to this other 7 Eleven right now. I'm gonna get a fucking slurpee right now. And these motherfuckers better not tell me to take out my fucking hoodie. And they better not give me a hard fucking time. These motherfuckers. Oh my god, this motherfucker better not fucking tell me to take out my fucking hoodie. I'm gonna I mean, this is like. I mean, this is straight up. Like, this dude is. Like a, like a serial, I guess not murderer, but he's just serially looking to beat some ass. Oh, fucking A. Look what I got, Slurpee. Look at my hood still on. Yeah, you know what, man? I'm fucking really glad this fucking dickhead right here, he, he sold me a Slurpee because if that motherfucker wouldn't have given me a Slurpee, then... I'd have had to boycott fucking 7-Eleven and all Slurpees, and I, I don't like to boycott Slurpees. What's up, guys? Yeah, I got some time to talk about this TRT shit right now. First of all, fucking any fighter that, that tries to get a TRT exemption is, is, is stupid, because now you're telling them you're doing it. You know what I mean? Now, like, you know what I mean? You're better off just to shut up. <laughs> yeah, come on, bro. Just shh. Don't tell, don't tell people about don't tell people about taking the TRT, dude. Or not TRT, but just like straight up steroids. TRT is testosterone replacement therapy. You can go to a doctor and get and ask the doctor to you know, give you steroids. About it. Steroids aren't magic. You know what I mean? It, most all athletes do it and they do it because they want to be the best they want to do the best and plus everyone else is doing it so it's it, it, it's like a, what are you gonna do what are you gonna do you know you can't do shit about it you know hey yo fuck 24 hour fitness man oh my god i'm fucking about to freak the fuck out i just left my fucking workout this fucking so i'm working out i'm doing fucking um uh weighted pull-ups uh 24 hour fitness and i'm using you know a chalk because I, I can you imagine this dude working out at the gym next to you dude you just gotta leave the fucking gym. There's no shot. This dude will kill you. He'll just get mad. What if he just like snaps on accident and then he just, yup, oops, you just got murdered. I go heavy, like I'm doing like 105 pounds and fucking it slips. You know, you see me chalk. 50 sales rep is he's kind of right. Most people don't need TRT unless they've been abusing other shit before and fucked their natural test. Yes. Uh, and some just fucking. This fucking like little fucking old skinny white fucking little bitch, this little man, I'm like I'm like chalking my hands and I fucking walk up, I walk up to the uh, to the bar. Why is his eye bleeding? Like, he goes, "Hey, chalk's not allowed in this gym," and I was like, "What?" He's like, and I was like, "I don't give a fuck." And he's like, "He's like, oh, you don't give a fuck?" I said, "I don't give a fuck." I said, "Get the fuck out of my way, motherfucker!" And he's like, "Oh, I've been here for six years." I said, "I don't give a fuck. I don't give a fuck. Get the fuck out of my way. Get the fuck out of my way." The fuck, I, I said, motherfucker, you break the fuck out of the fucking way. Oh, if I wasn't on probation, I would smash his fucking face. If it was the old days, oh my god, dude. And then I'm wearing my fucking, I do alpha male shit, fucking shirt, my tank top and shit. And he's like, oh, also, your shirt has profanity. I said, motherfucker. I said, okay, that other dude's kind of a fucking clown, though. Like, <laughs> your shirt has profanity. Like, shut up, bitch. Fuck you, dude. Like, Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't realize my shirt had profane. Get the fuck out of here, dude. I mean, I kind of, I kind of do see his take on this one. I see him. I see his side. His shirt's ugly as fuck. Shit is not fucking 
cuss word. And I was like, hey, man, I said, you're, fucking I said, you're taking too far, motherfucker. I said, you're taking too fucking far. I said, I'm gonna freak the fuck out. I said, the fuck out my fucking face. I said, I'm gonna finish your fucking workout, and then I'm gonna fucking cancel membership. I said, the fuck out my face. I'm, I'm gonna freak. I'm gonna snap. I'm gonna snap. Oh, yeah, so I, I go down uh, downstairs to check out. I tell the chick, like, hey, where's your little bitch ass manager? <laughs> and she looked at me all crazy. And then I and then I went into the manager's office. She's like, oh, I'm really sorry. I was like, I don't give a fuck. I said, get the fuck out of my fucking face right fucking now. I don't give a fuck. I don't give a fuck. Get the fuck out of my face. Dude, I think the wildest part is that, like, he thinks any number of these stories is actually making him look good or cool. That's the weirdest part about this, is that, like, he thinks this shit makes him look good. He's like, yeah, man, I really fucking popped off, dude. I popped off on this story, dude. Don't talk to me again in your fucking life. Oh my god, dude. I'm fucking pissed. Oh hey, go to alphamilshit.com and buy some shit. Cause fucking why not? Cause it's good shit. And because I don't know. I wanna make money. Cause I'm broke. Hey, what's up guys? Hey <laughs> I was watching uh the video from last night when I was freaking out about the uh twenty four hour fitness stuff. Dude, why is his face always fucked up? Like, is he, it, is he still fight training? Like, I don't understand. Or if he's fight, if he's training, like, why is he not using like protective gear? <laughs> sparring, probably. I mean, if he's sparring, why is he going to the twenty-four hour fitness to work off, <laughs> to work out? This is alpha male shit. You wouldn't understand. That's true. Makes me look like a fucking maniac, but I was fucking pissed for real. I'm on probation, and you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, I can't act the way I, that I used to act. You know, like a like a wild maniac, like I want to. You know, like so. I think this is gonna be kind of good, like the, the stupid um, these little video blogs, because then you know I could like kind of vent. You know, it's kind of like a diary, like a journal or whatever. I don't have to freak out and. And smash people instead, you know. It's kind of good, and it's it's kind of funny, you know. <clears throat> so when I watch it, when I watch it, uh, I'm like, "Fuck, dude, I look like a fucking psychomaniac." But that's all I get, man. I get so fucking pissed off, you know. So pissed off. But that guy was a dick, though. I don't, I don't know, I don't know what that guy's problem was. He was highly active on social media, and his intense, albeit controversial views, seemed to recapture his fan base to a considerable degree. For the first six months after his release from prison, rather than training to be a professional fighter, he mainly vlogged and focused on his brand, while posting the majority of his content to MySpace. Every day he would post a fresh cover photo without exception, and each image consisted of a scenic background with an inspirational Love message that. glazed over it. This became almost habitual activity, and I fucking love okay this is the best guy ever dude this is like okay that's another vibe check by the way that's the that is the final vibe check I love that that is my least it's great it's like one of the worst things I see on social media all the time so good all three strikes going to jail for life that is the third vibe check that he did not pass. And those who were following John's account could expect a new picture at around midnight every night. However, on Tuesday the 9th of April 2013, the routine procedure abruptly ceased, and for four days, his social media went completely silent. On Sunday the 14th, he would post just one cover photo, but then withdrew completely from all- The love doesn't feel like 80s reggae, then I don't want it all social media platforms for almost two weeks. This caused both his followers and the MMA community to speculate on his whereabouts, with many asserting he had gone back to prison for violating his parole, while others stated he was on the run for a drug charge. But he wasn't on the run, uh -huh. and he wasn't in prison. The rumors were quashed on Friday the 26th at exactly 4.34 p.m., as John's social media would once again come alive and see him post post multiple times a day, every day. Only this time he wasn't posting melodramatic quotes lifted from Google Images. As it appeared, he no longer needed them. Oh. This is my 
like when he uh, meets Christy Mack. Uh-oh. It was 22-year-old Christy McEnday, who at the time was a leading figure in the adult film industry. She rose to stardom in 2012 when she first began as a performer, and her profile continued to skyrocket as she hit the mainstream avenues. Her and Copenhaver met on a photo shoot for Hustler magazine during the spring of 2013, and struck up a relationship two weeks later. John went back to fighting and restored his winning streak, while Christy continued to rise in the world of adult entertainment. They both seemed to elevate each other's profiles simultaneously, and made several public appearances at award ceremonies and media outlets. They began receiving brand deals as a couple, and were even in talks with Bravo TV about starting their own reality show. Their crossing of paths appeared to align the stars. Everything started falling into place and the future looked promising. Yet the bright outlook on their flourishing careers and the prospect of being rich and famous would fade into trivial insignificance when compared to the extraordinary rush of falling in love. One thing that people understand, yet always seem to forget, is that you never truly know what goes on behind closed doors. Oof. Things aren't always as they seem, and the manner in which couples often present their lives in public can be a stark contrast to the reality when no one is watching. This is extremely common in abusive relationships, and will often be an unspoken ag- Hold on. 26 to 27, okay, yeah. All right, uh, that's the first, uh, I mean, it's not even TOS probably, but still. Agreement between the abused and the abuser. They will each maintain the pleasing facade while hiding the ugly truth. The abuser's public image will often be an outright contradiction to their true self, while the abused will happily play along as they can escape into fantasy and pretend it's all real for a few brief moments. A prolonged abusive relationship requires both parties to- Need some 2740 to- GG chat. No, 2740 to 2810 is the other part. Yeah, I know, it's coming up live vicariously through the perceptions of others. It would come to light that violence was a common occurrence in Christy and John's relationship, with Christy survive. being on the receiving end of it each and every time. She would eventually break things off in May 2014, but John kept a key to her apartment and showed up unannounced three months later to find her in bed with another man. Lego. That man was 35-year-old Corey Thomas, who was then beaten to a bloody pulp for roughly 10 minutes and suffered a dislocated shoulder, broken nose, and bite marked to the face. He was then put in a chokehold and made to swear that he wouldn't go to the authorities, at which point he gave John his word and was then let go. Copenhaver then set himself on Christy for almost two hours. She was raped, severely beaten, and cut with a knife. Her injuries included 18 broken bones in her face, 12 missing teeth, three rib fractures, and a severely ruptured liver. Once her attacker's back was turned... 2810, okay. She managed to escape out the balcony and stagger to a neighbor's garden where she was soon rescued by police. Officers then raided the apartment, but Copenhaver was nowhere to be found. He went on the run for over a week and posted tweets the entire time, basically professing how misunderstood and unfairly treated he was. He was eventually tracked down to a motel in Simi Valley, California and Animal taken dude. into custody. He was held without bond at the Clark County Detention Center for two and a half years awaiting trial. He pleaded not guilty to all 34 charges laid against him, which included one count of first-degree rape and two counts of attempted murder. His trial commenced on February 27th of 2017. Not sure if true, but the Wikipedia article on the case says he tried to rape her but couldn't get it up. Teen. Now, you will hear that... All of a sudden, while they're sleeping, this door comes open, the lights turn on, and the defendant is standing there. Both of them are shocked. They both kind of sit up in the bed. The defendant looks at Corey. He runs to Corey. He jumps on the bed, and he starts wailing on his face. Hit after hit after hit after hit. Corey sticks up his hands to protect himself, and then the defendant begins to choke him. Now, Christy, knowing that this is what the defendant does, very quickly hops out of bed and puts the two dogs out because the defendant has been violent towards her dogs in the past. She puts those dogs out. She then runs to the bathroom. She takes her cell phone and she makes a 911 call. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
<laughs> You'll have that 911 call back in evidence and be able to hear it clear. Ms. McIndae will tell you that at one point she wakes up, she's lying on her back, her legs are spread out in front of the defendant, excuse my language, and he says, that's my pussy and I'm going to take it back. He then licks his hand, places it on her vagina in an attempt to lubricate it as he tries to get himself hard, but he's not able to do so and that makes him angry, so he continues to beat her. Ladies and gentlemen, at the end of this trial, after you see all of the items yeah, big, big man, big alpha male man behavior right there. Evidence. After you hear the testimony of Corey Thomas, and after you hear the testimony of Christine McIndae, the state will ask you to go in, deliberate, come back, and find the defendant guilty of the crimes in which the state has charged him. I want to ask you a couple questions about an individual by the name of Christine McIndae. Do you know her? Yes. And how is it that you know her? <clears throat> uh, we did it. Tell me about that first date. How did it go? Went great. We met each other and you know got acquainted with each other and had some dinner about 7 p.m. Did you um, discuss any of her previous boyfriends at that time? Yeah, you kind of discussed that you know in, in the beginning opening day. Uh, she had mentioned that her her previous boyfriend happened to be. A so this guy, what happened to this guy? They like they, he he beat his he beat his face. He mangled his face too. Dislocated his jaw. Then he choked him out. And then he was able to, he was able to run away. Yeah, I know my voice is going because I've been yelling at fucking Dark Souls, dude. Holy shit. He bit his face. Yeah, MMA fighter. Uh, what was your understanding of her relationship with the MMA fighter previous mm. boyfriend? Oh, she said they had no relationship. They'd been over for six months. So then the door opened uh, to the room and the lights came on, and the defendant was standing there looking at me. Is that individual present in the courtroom today? Yes. Can you point to him and describe something he's wearing? Oh, sure, purple shirt, war machine. So the lights went on at that time, and then you were able to see his face? Yeah. Describe to me the expression on his face. A very surprised, big eye, um, very angry look, and you could see him say the words, what the fuck. What happens after he mouths those words to you? So I um, thought to myself, wow, what's, what's going to happen next? And I remember trying to put my hands onto the bed and kind of slide to, up to, towards the sitting position. But before I could get there, he had already jumped onto the bed from there to there. And he had started pounding me in the face. And where was he striking you? In the face. With what? With his knuckles, closed fist. Okay. Um, did he land any of those hits? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, what's going through your mind at this time? Uh, cover my face, but um, then I was just receiving hits right to the face, probably 10, 15 good, fast, quick hits. And I just covered, I started to cover my face as fast as possible and get my hands up. But they were still slipping in. You know, I mean, it's, the guy's a fighter, so it's like you can't cover everything. And um, I thought to myself, okay, I got to break him from hitting me. And I reached up, I grabbed him behind the neck with my right hand, and I pulled him down to flatten him out so he had to put his hands out. Though as he's coming down, then he bit me here in the cheek. Okay. And I could feel the bite, and once it registered I was getting bitten, then I put my hands back up to try and break him off of my face, and then he bit me in the arm as I was trying to push him up off of me. And then he's still hitting me, um, slipping in a lot, a lot of hits. So. Um, I used my feet and my hands to push him away from me, and I stepped off to the left side of the bed. I tried to roll over to the to the side of the bed, and then he came lunging at me and immediately went for my neck from behind and put a choke <coughs> on my neck. Uh, my head is about here, body's like this. He's choking me that way, and I'm looking up at the ceiling thinking to myself, oh my God, I'm not gonna die in Chrissy's bathroom. What were you feeling uh, as he's choking you? I was, starting to see stars and go unconscious. It was on my way. So then I, I thought to myself, well, I'm, I'm physically done. I think the only thing left here is to mentally try and change the table and see what's, what's possible. And I just asked a simple question. I said, well, what do you want from me? Do you want to kill me? Or do you want me to walk out of here? 
What was his response? At first, it was you know not really a response, just a just a, 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 a pause. Then he moved into threatening me and telling me, "Well, my friends are hell's angels, and my friends are Navy SEALs, and you know how do I know if I let you go, you're not going to be a snitch?" Did you tell him whether or not you would snitch? Yeah, I, I said, "Well, I'm no snitch." Okay. So that's that's that. You know. Oh my God. Like an agreement to to. Have oh my God, dude. Are you fucking serious? Handle this and this is over, then that's what it is. Okay. But um, he threatened me again, and and I said, well, you got really two options. You got to kill me or you got to let me go. And I kind of tried to just change the table, and I could feel him kind of release a little bit. I got to a, my feet and walked around the bed. I grabbed my things from this side of the bed. I looked at him, he looked at me, we nodded at each other, and I said, okay, and, and I walked out the door. I went up to the other room where we were last night, grabbed the rest of my stuff, and I walked right back up, down the stairs to the front door. I mean, he's snitching right now, so obviously he did, which is a good thing. I'm glad he did. You should have called the cops immediately, though. Were you able to... Um... Did you land any punches on him? No. No? And why not? Because I was busy getting punched. Okay. When you were leaving Ms. Mack's residence, did you um, hear um, any screaming or yelling between either the defendant or Ms. Mack and Dave? No. Uh, could you hear anything that made you believe that there was um, further violence going on in that house? From from hearing anything, no. Because in my mind, I mean, I mean, I would never, you know, that's, hitting a girl is not something that I would ever be able to understand doing. So, and in my mind, hit. What did you say? Hitting a girl. Hitting. A girl. Yeah, I was raised with three three sisters, my own mom, mom, my mother, and that's not something that would process in my mind. So I thought. Listen, guys, people are saying, why didn't you stay there? Like, you don't know what you would have done in that situation. It's life or death. Like everybody thinks they're going to do the honorable thing, but like this dude clearly was just like, I want to survive, motherfucker. Grug. Two guys fought. That's the end of hammies, it. And, hammies, hammies. You know, I'm Bro, just... motherfucker bites you, dude. UFC fighter. Is like pummeling your fucking face in. Dislocated your jaw by punching you and then is like biting you too on top of that. You think you're going to be like, oh yeah, let me go back in and, and, you know, fight the dude again. Like you 100% would not do that. You'd be dialing the cops so quick. Why wasn't he as manly as I pretend I would be exactly? I'm sure he is. Move forward. Um, do you have quite an affinity for animals? Yes, I do. Right. Do you, you have several pets? Yes. So during this time period that we're going to talk about in a little bit, which would be August of 2014, can you explain um, how many animals you had and you know, what kind of animal they were? Um, I have two dogs. And I had, I believe, five snakes at that time, and I had some rats. And um, John and I had shared two ferrets. Okay. Um, you said you used the term John. Uh, who's that? And you refer to him as War Machine. Okay. And was he your boyfriend at one time? Yes. Okay. Do you see him in the courtroom today? Yes, I do. Can you please um, just describe an article of clothing that he's wearing for me? He's wearing a white button-up shirt. Okay. Um, Your Honor, may the record reflect that she's identified the defendant? Yes, it will. Thank you. So, we were speaking about the defendant just a second ago. Um, how was it that you met him? Um, we met at an adult shoot for Hustler. Um, and it was just a, it was just a, like a photograph spread for Hustler magazine. Was it your, like, did you have an appointment to do the photo shoot at Hustler or did he? How did that work out?
very strange behavior. He did. They had asked him to do the shoot, and he said, I would only do it if you got Christy to do it. Okay. Did you know him at that point? No, I did not. Okay. Um, and so you agreed to do the shoot? Yes. And so um, the two of you obviously must have hit it off? Um, yeah, a little bit. Um, I was very standoffish. Um, I didn't want a relationship. I was very, I felt very independent, and I didn't want a man at that time. Okay. Um, but at some point you came into a relationship, right? Yes, we did. And so when was that? Um, just a few weeks after. When you started dating, how old were you? I believe I was 22. And how old was he? That would make him 32. What types of things, like when you, you know, when the relationship was going well, what types of things did the two of you do for fun? Um, we would go to movies, we would just go to the park, drive around sometimes. Um, I don't like being in crowds. Um, I have really bad social anxiety, so it makes me uncomfortable. Um, and I was going to ask you, are you somewhat of a, a homebody? Yes, definitely. Um, and do you drink? Not at all. Do you do any drugs? Never. Um, and so, Mr. Copenhaver, did, he, did that lifestyle match with him as well? Um, for a while it seemed that it did, but at times it definitely did not suit him at all. If I were to ask you, like, how would you explain your relationship? What would you say? Um, our relationship was definitely very, very passionate. Um, and at times very violent, but sometimes extremely loving. Did the defendant go quickly to anger? Um, during the fights? Um, usually, yes. Um, at some point in your relationship, did, did you start to see an angry side of him? Yes, I did. In the beginning, or when you first started seeing this side to him, um, was the violence physical? Not in the beginning. Okay, can you explain the, how it was? Um, in the beginning, he would remove himself from the situation. Did it get to a point um, where when he got angry, he wasn't leaving the room anymore? Yes. Um, and did there start to become physical violence in your relationship? Yes, they did. When, when did that start happening? Um, I want to say three or four months in. In the beginning, it would just be like a slap in the face, and that would be it, or just choking me, and that would be it. When he would do this, was your breathing impeded? Yes, it was. Um, would you like see stars or lose consciousness? Usually, yes. Usually you would lose consciousness? Yes. How often were these types of things happening, like the slaps or the chokes? At first, they, they weren't that frequent, maybe once a month. Um, but as our relationship progressed, the violence progressed also. Um, did you ever fight back? No. No, your mom lived with you in your home in Las Vegas. Yes, she did. And you said that the defendant hated your mom. Yes. And was there a constant... Um, I mean, it went both ways, is that fair to say? Yes, it did. They, they both hated each other. When he would do these things to you, like these choking events or slapping events, um, would he ever take any personal property from you? He would usually take my phone. And Christ. why would he take your phone? He was afraid that I was going to call my mom. Why would that scare him if you called your mom? Because my mom would call the police. Did you feel comfortable telling your mom or your friends that these types of things were happening to you? No, um, I hid it from my mom the best I could. Um, I don't like my mom to worry about me, and then I also didn't want her to call the police. Were you were you embarrassed that these? How has this motherfucker been like in my community for 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 months and has been sub to me for months? And is like literally a fucking psychopathic incel. Talking about the, the one time it, it took for. It's always so weird when like. It's always so weird when. Shit comes out like this where it's like this dude might be like a totally normal dude otherwise. Two month dandy poggers. And then as soon as he sees like he just like reverts back to the incel ways. No, it's not a War Machine fan. That, this is a lonely... Oh, oh, never mind. Oh, he tried to say the N-word in the chat. I don't know why we didn't clap him beforehand.
We missed it. Never mind. But like classic incel, he's like mad that this, that, that this woman was in an abusive relationship and not mad at the abuse, but instead mad that like she chose to be with the abusive person instead of someone like him, you know, I'm sure, um, I'm sure, uh, that, uh, women don't want to be with you because you're horrible. You're a horrible monster. These things were happening to you? I was extremely embarrassed. I never thought that I could let that happen to me. Um, I always saw myself as a strong individual. And um, I realize now that I shouldn't have been embarrassed. But at the time, I definitely was. Did he ever threaten you if you did tell? Yes, he did. What did he say? Um, he would, he said he would send his Navy SEAL friends and the Hells Angels after either myself or my family if he went to, if he went to prison. Christie recounts four graphic occurrences of her getting physically assaulted by the defendant, with the fourth being over another guy designing her gold-plated fangs. He, he ripped my wig off and I took my fangs out because I knew he was going to hit me next and I didn't want to either chip my teeth or swallow one of the fangs. Okay. So you took them out? What yes. happened after you took the things out? Um, I put them into my bag and he began screaming at me more and more and he turned the car around to go back where we came from. I had taken my seatbelt off because I knew if we hit a stoplight, I'd be able to escape and I wouldn't have to get hit this time. Okay. So um, I took my seatbelt off without him noticing and I tried, when we reached the stoplight, thank God we hit, we hit a stoplight, I opened the door to try and escape and he pulled me back in by my hair so and slammed my head down on the dashboard, which chipped my tooth. And then he Stop. was still really mad, so he grabbed my head and brought me in and bit my chin right here. In the left part of your bottom chin? Yes. And, uh, and I don't remember how many times he hit me after that, but he turned down the side road by the Best Buy and he said, now I have to kill you because people saw you trying to escape. He said, now I have to take you to the desert and kill you. I was, st I still have my seatbelt off. I was bent over crying. And at some point he punched me in the back. Um, and then he took me to a gym parking lot and he calmed down a little bit. And uh, he, he licked his hand and tried to wipe some of the blood away. He told me he couldn't take me home like this because my mom was home. Um, he told me he had to clean me up, but everything was going to be fine. Um, and then after that, he took me home. He went inside first. Um, when my mom greeted him, she, he said that I was just, you know, um, getting some stuff out of the car and that I would be in shortly. And then when she went back to her room, he allowed me to come in and go upstairs and clean myself up. What were your injuries after that incident? Um, I, had, I had a black eye and I had a cut under my eye. I had a scratch on my nose where he had hit me. Um, I had a bite mark here. Um, and that, that's pretty much it, my chipped tooth. Um, I once told my mom, you know, I, was just, I just fell down the stairs in my bedroom. Um, of course, the, the cliche, I fell down the stairs. Um, but I, I ended up using that. Um, I told my friends that you know, it was just a dog scratch or, you know, my dogs are large, that a dog had hit me in the head, like head butted me, like it was, I would just come up with any excuse that I could use. You said in the days afterwards, um, he would take care of you. So let's say that you know there's there's an incident um, like we were just talking about, um, and then you have marks on your face. In the next days, how would he treat you? It would be the best days of our relationship. He would stay home from training just to be with me, and uh, he would we would watch all my favorite movies. He would go to the store and get all the snacks that I wanted. He'd go get coffee for me. We would order, you know, take in a delivery. Um, he would just be around me and make sure that I was okay. Was he loving during those periods? Extremely loving. This is known in psychology as the cycle of abuse, or more specifically, 
Phase 3, sometimes referred to as the honeymoon stage. After an abusive episode, the abuser will often seek connection. They will act romantic, apologetic, and remorseful. The abused will primarily feel relief in that they are no longer being attacked, but they may also begin to feel a stronger connection to the abuser due to the abrupt switch of contrasting emotions. When intense fear and intimidation is directly followed by affection and warmth, the intimate nature of the latter can become significant. Why are there so many incels in here? I'm looking out for you. Like after a really fucking harrowing retelling of a woman um, describing in great detail her experience with uh, domestic abuse. If your uh, immediate take is like, I can't believe like this bitch stayed with him and I can't even get a girl to fucking text me back. I'm going to let you know that right there is the reason why you can't get girls to text you back. And probably for good reason. Like that sense of entitlement probably comes across as fucking annoying. You know? And if you don't keep that shit in check and don't recognize it as like unacceptable behavior, I worry you could turn into a, a guy like this too. That motherfucker started off as an incel at some point as well. Okay. significantly intensified. The abused will then feel reassured and hopeful about the relationship, and this denial approves the illusion of safety. During Having a rational thought that she's kind of dumb for not leaving the relationship means you're an incel? Okay. I'm going to ban you as well, and then I'm going to quietly but, but carefully try to describe that when someone is being domestically abused, saying that it's their fault for uh, being in a cycle of abuse is one of the most moronic, baboon-like statements that I could, that I have ever heard. I know I say shit like that from time to time when we're watching 90 Day Fiance, but those situations are not the same as like being in a harrowing, horrible, domestic abuse scenario, not just emotional abuse, but also physical abuse on top of that. You are victim blaming. It's not that easy to get out of relationships like this. Part of it is literally what is being explained on screen right now. The cycle of abuse, the emotional, uh, the, the, um, the, the trauma, and then the subsequent like recovery period that keeps you locked in, like held hostage this way, in a terrible fucking uh, abusive situation like this. There's also the fear. Not only do you uh, have the fear of the unknown, what will my life be without this person who I've been living with, but also on top of that, the fear that like the person might literally fucking murder you. If this is a person who beats the shit out of you, a person who loves you, who beats the shit out of you all the goddamn time, what the fuck are they going to do when they realize you are about to leave them? So it might be very easy for your no pussy having ass to have a dumbass fucking take like this, you weirdo fucking incel, but not necessarily the easiest thing to be in a situation like this and just... Not see yourself out of it, forehead. Also, I need you to understand that this person had already left the relationship. This is three months after she had already broken up with John Coppenhaver, aka War Machine. He happened to still have a key to her apartment. 
and came in while she was on it after a date having sex with some other guy. Months after the relationship had ended. So shut the fuck up. And she was right, by the way. She left him, and he almost fucking murdered her. Denkies. She should have changed her locks. Not an excuse, though. Okay. Anybody Cost else wants some, dude? Has Yo, rage. this is literally the... I mean, it's a, it's a woman. Uh, a, a woman that is a victim of domestic abuse. And a sex worker. So, you know. Uh, the, the different kinds of chatters are doing self-reports all over the place. Similar to when we see, like, a black victim murdered by, uh, like, a white dude. It's so very cool. I like covering stories like this because it gives me time and opportunity to clean this community a little bit. You know? People just can't hold themselves back. They have to go mask off. During therapy, the counselor will often refer to this as the merry-go-round. The reason for this is because the cheerful image of an amusement ride is believed to make it less intimidating, and therefore easier to both spot and then accept when the cycle of abuse is occurring. Christy then goes on to graphically recount just one of the multiple times she was raped by the defendant. When this is going on, are you, you know, are you saying anything? Are you fighting? I start by saying, no, please don't, like, I don't want this to happen. And then I just give up. Did you make clear to him that I, I, this is not what I want? Yes, I did. I began crying at some point. Um, I tell him, stop. And then I just lay there. After it was done, how, how did it end? Um, he got off and then I went to the shower and, and just kept crying. And he started screaming at me, what the fuck's wrong with you? After this has happened, <clears throat> Um, did you still maintain a, a relationship with him? Yes, I did. Why did you continue to stay with him when these things were being done to you? I loved him. Um, I would have done anything for him. I, I just wanted to be with him. Another hour of testimony goes by where Christy details multiple occurrences of physical and psychological abuse. She eventually gets to the moment when Corey Thomas had just left the apartment after being assaulted by Copenhaver. Now you said that after Corey leaves you remember the defendant running at you. Yes. And then you remember, the next thing you remember is being in the shower. Yes. Do you remember how you got in the shower? I don't know how I got in the shower. Do you remember, um, when you were in the shower did you have clothes on or off? They were off. Um, and the, the shorts that I were wearing were in the shower. When you were in the shower, uh, what was the defendant doing? He was going through my phone and yelling at me through the glass door. What was he yelling about? I don't remember exactly what he was yelling about anymore. At that point in time, do you, did you think you had been hit? Yes, um, I could taste blood in my mouth. So I knew I had been hit in the face. And I also have, I don't remember how I got in the shower. What's the next thing you remember? Um, past that. I went to, I just remember being on all fours right in front of the shower, uh, like I was about to stand up, and he kicked me in the ribs so hard that I fell over and began convulsing. Did you ever ask him for help or to stop? Just after this, um, I told him that I needed help. Because I, I genuinely felt like I was going to die at this point. What did he say to you? He told me that nobody could help me. At any point in time, did he... Yeah, one, um, one, yeah. Every Dude, there isn't fucking... There aren't fucking racist and incels. There's 45,000 people in here, and anyone who wants to say anything can say anything. It is insane for you to ex uh, assume yeah. that this Pogo community with time. fucking 45,000 people in here is full of racists and incels. Of course there's going to be fucking racist people and incel people. You Literally go to any, buddy. any live stream on the planet in any community and you're going to find a litany, a barrage of fucking abuse in the chat. 
so much more than this community. It's ridiculous to assume that like, I will make because there's like illegal. 50 fucking people that we clap over the course of like a 10 hour stream with 50,000 people watching that I'm not going to run the top of the hour ad break four minutes after the top of the hour. Like, it's crazy that you think that I wouldn't just, uh, you know, break away from the uh, subject matter expertly and hit you with a fucking ad break. I have to. I'm not going to wait until the end of the video because uh, it goes on for a while. Um, yeah. If you'd like to no longer see the ads, <laughs> you can subscribe. You like money more than her fans. The real... The realist profits is you like money more than your fans? Yeah, that's why I just banned a six-month subscriber and another uh, two-month subscriber while publicly accosting them. My interest in, in money was the reason why I did that. Because everybody that subscribes loves seeing someone who's been a fucking community member for a very long time get publicly shamed. I banned a 17-month subscriber yesterday. You know, all of my... All of my love for, for money is the reason why I, I routinely do public executions of chatters like this by bringing it up to the public square and putting them down so they understand that like you should not feel safe just because you've given me money Sag. you understand imagine subbing to this ape yeah literally imagine dude you're not subbed right now, so I was literally about to ban you. Imagine getting banned by this ape. Dude, imagine, dude. Imagine not being able to chat because you wanted to do a meme. Anyway, here's the ad break now. I forgot to run it. Pogu, 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 pogu. All right, let's keep going. Did ever use any weapons against you? Yes, he did. Can you explain how? He had a knife. Um, it was one of my, my kitchen set knives. It was a black handle with silver rivets. And um, he would push it into my ear. He would push it into my hand. He sawed off my hair. Um, he cut up all of my wigs because he always hated my wigs. He, he cut my head. The knife. Yes. As a domestic abuse survivor, I just remember him still being so angry. He broke the handle off of the knife and still continued to use the knife blade um, in his hand to push it into me. Does, is there come a point where he? He's like too much of a fucking ape to successfully like finish the task. Luckily, like his anger. Like he was, he was so angry that he fucking broke the knife, dude. Like, literally, unable to... Like, what a fucking animal, dude. Crows can use tools. You know what I mean? Like, monkeys can use tools. And this fucking psycho in that murderous rage was... Was, like, literally dumber than a fucking monkey. L.
tells you that he's going to have to kill you. Yes. What does he say? He looks at me and he says, now I have to kill you. I've gone too far. I, you can't be seen like this. Everyone's going to know. Copenhaver then goes downstairs to the kitchen to retrieve another blade, at which point Christy gets to her feet, staggers to her first story balcony, and jumps off. She then musters the strength to make her way down to the end of the street, where her neighbor spots her hiding in the garden and calls 911. Christy was taken to the hospital and treated for her injuries. The horrific images circulated on social media, and the hashtag war machine began trending. Hold on in the United States, Canada, Brazil, and the United Kingdom. The mugshot of the perpetrator became... Yeah, by the way, she was gonna die. Like, he... That was... Murder was gonna happen. But because he was such a fucking animal, in all of his rage, like, he broke the knife, and in the process of retrieving a second one, she was able to only then the get away. the most retweeted image during the second week of August 2014, and this eventually led to his arrest. The trial was a hot topic in the national news, with each of the elements receiving a considerable amount of coverage, yet the most talked about was Erin McIndae. Christie's mother. She would testify on day seven of the trial and manage to come across as both endearing yet intimidating at the same time. The type of person you would want as a friend, but most certainly would not want as your enemy. Just briefly, like, how would you characterize Christie? What type of child was she? She was a very quiet child. She liked to keep to herself. She was very loving. Um, she was very creative. She liked to color and draw and play with Barbies. Oh, and billion, seven million, eight hundred she, and seventy-three thousand two hundred and twenty-four. She was outstanding in know. school. I never had to stand over her and say, "Do your homework." It was an automatic thing for her. Um, would you say she's an extrovert or an introvert? I would say introvert for sure. As far as you know, um, does she drink alcohol? No. Um, or, or did she drink Never. Alcohol? She's never had alcohol. Um, what about drugs? Anyone no. Wants to In 2013, did Christine start Big dating someone um, by the name of Jonathan Copenhaver? Yes. Do you see him here? I do. He's wearing a white shirt, playing oh. with his fingers. Okay. Your Honor, may the record reflect the identification of the defendant? Yes, it will. Thank you. Now, uh, does he look the same to you as he sits here today? No. How does he look different? He looks like he's lost about 50, 60 pounds. He's not as broad in the arms and in the shoulders. Um, did you start to see any changes in Christine after she had been with him? Yes. For That's right. That's a dig at his fucking steroid abuse right there. A few months. Yes. Can you please describe some of those changes? She was more isolated from me. She didn't want to do anything with me. She would spend more time in her room. Um, she wasn't as talkative. Uh, her social media. Say so you're frail. Hassle. One of her accounts was closed. She was more of an, she's always been independent. Even as a little girl, she was independent. And you could see her independence kind of slip away as time went on. Were you ever present uh, at the home when the defendant became physically violent towards your daughter? I was in that room that day and I heard screaming and fighting. And I came out of my bedroom and I said, what the F is going on? They're screaming at each other. I don't even, I can't even remember what they were screaming, but Christy was standing up on the stairs. I'm not sure where John was and she said he grabbed me by my neck and drug me up the stairs. And I'm like, I'm calling the police. And you could see she had a red mark on her throat. So he, I, I'm sorry, when she said that to you, when she said he grabbed me by my throat, is she talking like you and I are talking or is- No, she was screaming, she was hysterical. Okay. I think at that point, John had gone up to the bedroom to pack his stuff. Cause when I said, I'm calling the police, he, he's leaving. And he stood in the closet with his laundry bag, taking his clothes and stuffing it in there going, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to kill you. I'm going to kill you. Was the relationship be between the defendant and you, um, it had it pretty much deteriorated? Yes. 
Um, and because of that, was, was Christy often kind of in the middle between the two of you? Yes. Was it clear at this point that you didn't like him? And oh, he I didn't couldn't like stand you? him at that point. I didn't like him. And I, I told Christy, you know, I started noticing things and I told her my opinion and it was just, she'd say, I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to talk about it. And then at 644, um, you receive a text message from the defendant, you awake yet, several question marks. There was a huge fight when I came in, the guy she was in bed with came at me. So when you start getting these text messages, oh, you know, what do you do? What's going through your mind? I tried to call him because I couldn't text fast enough. I just woke up. I was trying to read those and try to process out of a straight sleep. What am I looking at? What I'm, My mind's trying to catch up to everything that's going on. And so I tried to call him and I said, what's going on? And he goes, we got into a fight and I had to beat her up. And, and from that point on, I just, I think I hung up the phone. I went and told my boyfriend, you've got to get up now. He's done something to Christy. Move your car so I can get across town. My boyfriend said, oh God. So did you get in your car and go across town? He moved Christy? his car and I started driving. And I think the next time I had a thought, I was actually underneath the desert in the viaduct, the, the bridge on DI. Okay. Do you know what I'm talking yes, about? I, I think that's the last cognitive thought that I really had from the house to there, and my thought was, she's dead. That did, was my thought. Did you get to Christie's house? I did. And when you got there, um, were there already police officers and everything? Yes, ma'am. And what did you do? Um, I stopped my truck in the street. I got out of my truck. I saw that the front door was open. I started running. There were officers outside of the house trying to tell me to stop. There were some officers inside the house and I made it as far as to the inside door and it was almost like I was like face to face with a lady police officer. And um, she was gonna beat his ass, dude. Looked at me and I looked at her and I said, is my daughter dead? And she just looked at me and she said, no, she's at Sunrise Hospital. I get to the ER and I said, I'm Christy Max, mom, I wanna see my daughter. And I walked in and she was laid in the bed and it didn't look like her. Such an and I walked around and I grabbed her hand. And she said, please don't cry. So I squatted down underneath the bed so I wouldn't upset her. And I held her hand and I cried. <laughs> Seven months, oh good, please don't cry, Hassie. At, while you were speaking with Christy, um, did you attempt to help her find something that she was looking for? Yes. And what was that? Her cell phone. Did you text the defendant and ask him for it? Christy told me that he had taken her cell phone. So I started sending him text messages that I wanted that fucking phone. Were you ever able to get the cell phone? No. If looks could kill. According to the Journal of Neuroscience, the mother and daughter relationship is the strongest of all bonds. But I'm part there. of the brain that regulates emotion is more similar. Be I don't know if that's real or not, by the way. JCS does say a bunch of shit like this all the time. What? But goddamn, she literally looks like she's gonna. No, the, the neuroscience thing that she's talking about, not the looks could kill thing he's talking about.
between mothers and daughters than any other intergenerational pairing, and this means a mother is more able to put herself in her daughter's shoes when facing a problem, and thus empathize with her struggle to a far greater extent. Was, um, without talking about your conversations with Christy, was, were there, was there a folder on Christy's phone that she specifically wanted you to get? Yes. Uh, <coughs> for, during the remainder of Christy's stay at the hospital and then for several weeks after, um, did you kind of try to keep her in a safe place in, a, in hiding? Yes. Um, until the defendant had been apprehended? Yes. Now you talked a little bit about uh, Christy when you came to her in the hospital and started crying. She told you to, she told you to quit crying. Um, Say yes. Yes, I'm sorry. It's okay. It's, I know it's hard, but I need an out, out answer. Would you consider her an emotional person? No. Do you consider it easy for her to share things? No. In regards to this incident, um, does she talk, want to talk about it? No. <coughs> because of the incidents that you've spoken about, you know, that you, you had seen the defendant physically violent. The reason why this seems like the hardest one to watch out of all the murder cases you've seen is because this is the most, like, likely to happen to you. That's why. Because, like, we watch murder cases and it's just, like, a dude murdering someone and then chopping them into pieces and stuff like that methodically and talking about it. And the victim is not there to talk about their experience because they're dead. This is like a very likely scenario that happens all the fucking time. And you're literally watching the victim describe the details of her own abuse. So. That's why. Monk is dead. Um, and because you saw your daughter with marks and you had concerns. Do you regret now, you know, not stepping in and going to the police? No. Mm -mm. The other incidents that I saw, I really wish I would have shot you. That's my retrospective. I wish I would have shot you. Oh, okay. thank you so much. So that concludes my direct examination. Okay. Cross. The trial lasted three weeks, and the verdict came in on March 20th, 2017. Verdict. We, the jury in the above title case, find the defendant, War Machine, a.k.a. Jonathan Copenhaver, as follows. Count one. Battery constituting, constituting domestic violence strangulation, ferret cage. Guilty of battery constituting, constituting domestic violence. Court. Count two. Coercion. Guilty of coercion without force. <clears throat> Count three, preventing or dissuading witness or victim from reporting crime or commencing prosecution. Guilty of preventing or dissuading witness or victim from reporting crime or commencing prosecution. The jury deadlocked on the two counts of attempted murder, but Copenhaver was still convicted on 29 others, including kidnapping and sexual assault with a weapon. He was sentenced on June 5, 2017. Erin McAday and her daughter, Christy McAday, both made brief statements before the sentencing of Jonathan Copenhaver, the 35-year-old mixed martial arts fighter known as War Machine. I don't know if my life will feel complete in 12 years, or 20 years, or even 30 years. And neither do you. I have to look out for the uh, well-being of the community and avoid the possible danger to future potential victims as I uh, consider the appropriate sentence here. Copenhaver was ordered to serve 36 years to life after being convicted of more than two dozen charges, including sexual assault and first-degree kidnapping. So there you have it. The rise and fall of John War Machine Copenhaver. It's a human paradox that many of us will only consider the big picture once it's already too late. The endless opportunity and potential that lay in front of him was thrown away for something as trivial as jealous rage. He will more than likely spend the rest of his life in prison. Okay, the endless opportunity thrown wasn't just jealous rage. He was a fucking freak. He was like very clearly an abusive freak who literally routinely was looking to 
to unload on people, just like pummel on people. Do I think he can be rehabilitated? Yes. You saw him on Joe Rogan? War Machine was on Joe Rogan? When? Wait, he's like, he has an Instagram account now or some shit? What, what is that? He still posts? He has a kid. In one place, homie. Yeah, he got married. He got married in jail and he has a kid. Apparently he like had some fucking fans in jail. He posts about God a lot now. Wait, is he still in jail or is he out of jail? I don't understand. And he still, and he still uses the, the testimony. Someone else runs the Insta for him. Oh, okay. St. Pierre, <laughs> his first fight, if you watch it, it's like in Canada, in a ring. Mm -hmm. Smart if you were a business. You yeah. Know, well, no, if you were a business, it's smart. Oh, but sure. they do market fighters as well. Look, Ronda Rousey, I know how much Ronda Rousey's making. She's making incredible money. If you're a pay-per-view draw... If you're a George St. Pierre, if you're someone that's making a ton of money, you make you make money based on how many pay-per-views you sell. So yeah. they're they're making shitloads of money. So there's what people read online as far as like how much the UFC pays. It's like these are the um, disclosed revenue, the disclosed incomes. But that's not what they get paid. There's a bunch of other shit involved as well. There's there's bonuses, and then on top of the bonuses, there's what they get for each pay-per-view sale. So they don't disclose, and a lot of it's because a lot of fighters don't want people to disclose. But if you're a guy who's starting out and you want to eventually work your way up. Joe didn't know about the abuse? Yeah, how would he have known the abuse in the future, dude? Like, this is before he actually... This is before he fucking went to jail, dude.